Good morning. Happy Sabbath. I hope everybody had a good week. The title of my sermon this morning, What Will They Remember? There's a story in the book, 1,000 Illustrations for Preaching and Teaching, titled, A School in Home. Samuel and Susanna Wesley were dedicated Christians. Samuel was a rector. His wife was the daughter of a minister. Altogether, they had 19 children. John was the 15th child, and Charles was the 18th child. Eleven of their children died. They were, there were very precious few modern conveniences in their day. There was no automatic washers, no electricity, no refrigerators, no running water, no telephone, no radio, no quick means of communication or travel. Yet we read that Susanna Wesley expected each of her children to know the alphabet by the time he or she was age five. At age six, they would begin school in the living room of the house. Susanna taught her children six hours a day, from 9 to 12 in the morning and from 2 to 5 in the afternoon. Furthermore, she gave an hour a day to each child for spiritual development. It made such a profound impression on the lives of the children that later years they often commented that they wished they had the opportunity to spend with their mother in spiritual counsel once again. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for inviting us to come and spend time with you on this Sabbath. We ask that you come and join us. We claim the promise that says you are where two or three are gathered in your name. So please come and join us this morning. May we hear you speak, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Proverbs 22 and verse 6. Proverbs 22 and verse 6. Get an amen when you're there. Proverbs 22 and verse 6. Proverbs 22 and verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he grows older, he will not abandon it. The Young's literal translation says it this way. Train a child in the way appropriate for him. And when he becomes older, he will not turn from it. Now I'm going to talk primarily to mothers today because next week on Mother's Day weekend, I will not be here. All of you who are not mothers are welcome to listen. There's something that is very important about a mother. What is it? It is what she teaches her children. Does she teach them to fear and love the Lord? Or does she teach them the ways of the world? Today I want to consider four mothers and their children. Let's consider whether these mothers gave their children healthy fear and love for God, or whether they gave them nothing that would relate to character development and spiritual things. There are many mothers that we could talk about, and many children of those mothers. We could talk about Daniel and his mother. We could talk about Daniel's three friends and their mother or mothers, which we don't know. We could talk about the mother of the twelve apostles. We could talk about Paul and his mother. We could talk about Timothy and his mother. The list of mothers and children is very long. So for today, we're only going to look at four notable mothers and their children. Let's start with the mother of Joseph. There's not a lot to know about the mother of Joseph. She was supposed to marry Jacob. But before she could, her older sister did. She ultimately did end up marrying him also. And she had two children, Joseph and Benjamin. Scholars guess that Rachel was somewhere in the age, I mean, Joseph was somewhere in the age of seven when Rachel died, giving birth to his brother, Benjamin. What kind of things did she teach Joseph while she was living? From the story of Joseph, I think it's safe to say that she taught him a love and fear for God Almighty. 
I'm sure that there were plenty of other things that she taught him. But the most important thing that she did teach him was knowing God. How can I be sure that she taught him to love and fear God? Joseph was around the age of 17 when he was sold as a slave in Egypt. Undoubtedly, as we read his story, we can be sure his early years were shaped by his mother and the things that she taught him. In the face of great trials and great temptation, he remained true to God. We all know how the story of Joseph ends with him going to prison for something that he did not do, because he stood for what was right. Just because you trust God does not mean that bad things are not going to happen in your life. Turn with me to John 16, verse 33. John 16, verse 33. Get an amen when you're there. John 16 and verse 33. John 16 and verse 33. Get an amen when you're there. John 16 and verse 33. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the trouble, in the world, you have tribulation. But take courage, I have overcome the world. What did Jesus say? In the world, you have tribulation. He did not say it might happen. He did not say it could happen. He did not say there might be the possibility of tribulation. He said there will be tribulation. In the original language, the verb for have used here is a present active indicative. What that means is that if you are not having tribulation, you may want to go home and check yourself. You may want to go have a heart-to-heart -heart with the one who knows your heart. You may want to check and see if the reason that you are not having tribulation is because you are not close enough to Jesus for the devil to think you're a threat. Jesus did not say there would be tribulation because you went looking for it. He said there would be tribulation because you are his. And if you are his, the enemy does not like you. If you follow Jesus, you have tribulation because the devil is not happy that you're following Jesus. And he wants to pull you away from Jesus. In all that Joseph endured... He placed his hope and trust where? In God. But I'm sure it all started on his mother's knee when he was young. Our next mother is Jochebed. Turn with me to Exodus 2, 9 and 10. Exodus 2, 9 and 10. Get an amen when you're there. Exodus 2, verse 9 and 10. Exodus 2. 9 and 10. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. And the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she named him Moses and said, Because I drew him out of the water. Now, Jochebed did not have her son for a long period of time before she took him to Pharaoh's daughter. Moses was 12 years old when he left his mother's care to go and live in the royal courts. At the age of 12, he became the son of Pharaoh's daughter. At this young age, he no longer had a godly influence in his life. From then on, the influence that, influences that he experienced would seek to destroy and disrupt his relationship with God. At the age of 12, Moses was set in a place where he could do whatever he wanted, and he had the world at his fingertips. Moses was given everything that a 12-year-old boy could possibly want. Moses grew up with power and pomp. When he came by in the chariot, people would bow. He had everything this world could offer him. 
But he did not want the things of this world because he had learned to fear and love God from his mother. What does the Apostle Paul say about Moses? Turn with me to Hebrews eleven twenty four to 27. Hebrews eleven twenty four to 27. Get an amen when you're there. Hebrews eleven twenty four through 27. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the temporary pleasures of sin, considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. For he was looking to the reward by faith. He left Egypt not fearing the wrath of the king, for he persevered as though seeing him who is unseen. By faith, Moses left Egypt. He was looking to the one who is unseen. By faith, Moses hung on to the things his mother had taught him when he was young. And because of this consistent trust in God, he was able to see God's glory. Turn with me to Exodus 33, 18 and the first part of 19. Exodus 33, 18 and 19. Exodus 33, 18 and 19. Get an amen when you're there. Then Moses said, Please show me your glory. And he said, I myself will make my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. Because of a mother's love and devotion to God, and her training her son to love and fear the same God, her son was allowed to see God's glory. Moses did not want the things of this world because he had been given a love and a fear for something far better. Moses' mother gave him a relationship with God that nothing in this world could take away from him. Our third mother is Hannah, and her son is Samuel. Samuel was a gift from God to Hannah, and she dedicated him to God for a lifetime of service. Samuel was probably around the age of three when, he, when his mother took him down to the temple. Hannah left her son in the care of Eli, who raised him from age three until he was grown. However, Samuel did not forget his early learning from his mother. Samuel could have turned out like Eli's children, since he was raised by the same father and mother. What does the Bible tell us about the sons of Eli? 1 Samuel 2.12. Let's look at 1 Samuel 2.12. Get an amen when you're there. 1 Samuel 2 and verse 12. 1 Samuel 2.12. Now the sons of Eli were useless men. They did not know the Lord. The sons of Eli were useless men who did not know the Lord. So the environment that Samuel was raised in was not the most favorable environment to turn out as a God-fearing child. He could have easily followed the path of the sons of Eli and let them influence him, but he did not. Instead of a path of sin and greed, Samuel clung to what he had learned from his mother's knee. Samuel rejected the temptations of the world because his mother lived a godly life. His mother had not only taught him what a godly life was, but she showed Samuel what it means to love the Lord and to serve him by her own example. The last mother we're going to consider is Mary, the mother of Jesus. What a calling to raise the son of of God. What a privilege to raise the Son of God. Imagine the immense pressure that she felt. Imagine the joy she must have experienced as she raised him. Imagine raising a child that no matter what people did to him or her, your child always responded in love. Imagine raising a child that would always put others first. Never want the bigger piece. Never want the best part. But always leave it for another. 
Imagine raising a child who would always say, not my will, but yours be done, when talking to our Father in heaven. Imagine raising a child of God. What must it be like? Newsflash for you, those of you who are raising children. You are raising a child of God. You don't believe me? Turn with me to 1 John 3, 1. 1 John 3, 1. 1 John 3, 1. Let's let the scripture tell us. Let's not make assumptions. 1 John 3, verse 1. Get an amen when you're there. 1 John 3 and verse 1. See how great a love the Father has given to us that we would be called children of God. And in fact, we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. We all are children of God. So if you are raising a child, you are raising a son or daughter of God. If we choose to live for Him, we are all His children. So what does it take to raise children to be the shining superstars like the stories in the Bible? How can you have success like Rachel and Jochebed and Hannah and Mary when raising your child? Turn with me to Luke 1, 28 to 30. Luke 1, 28 to 30. Get an amen when you're there. Luke 1, 28 to 30. Luke 1, 28 to 30. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and was pondering what the kind of greeting this was. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Twice in these three verses, the angel says, You have favor with God. First in verse 28, he says, you are a favored one. And in verse 30, he says, you have found favor with God. As I read this story, I came down to verse 38, which ends this part of the narrative. And on the surface, there is nothing notable about this verse when we read it in English. But the word for bondservant that is used here gives us a clue as to why Mary found favor with God. The Greek word bondservant is the word doule. This is what the theological dictionary of the New Testament says about the word doule. Doule indicates a service which is not a matter of choice for the one who renders it, which he has to perform whether he likes it or not because he is subject as a slave to an alien will, to the will of his owner. Orketes is almost exactly synonymous, but in Dule, the stress is rather on the slave's dependence on his Lord, while oiketes emphasizes the position of the slave in relation to the outside world. So what we learn here is that the reason Mary was favored was because of her dependence on God. The reason Mary was chosen was not because of who she was, but rather because of who she depended on. The reason Mary was chosen because of her, was because of her relationship with God. Turn with me to Proverbs 3, 1 through 4. Proverbs 3, 1 through 4. Get an amen when you're there. Proverbs 3, 1 through 4. Proverbs 3, 1 through 4. My son, do not forget my teaching, but have your heart comply with my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and a good reputation in the sight of God and man. The verse says, my son, but since we are primarily talking to mothers today, I'm going to say, my daughter, do not forget 
my teaching. Now clearly Solomon is talking to his son here. But who inspired Solomon to write these words for you and I to read? This is God's word written to inspire you and to draw you into a closer relationship with him. So I would like all of you daughters of God to take this verse and apply it to yourself. So this is God talking directly to you as his daughters. My daughter, do not forget my teaching, but have your heart comply with my commandments. My daughter, length of days and years of life and peace will be yours. How do you get length of days and peace? By complying with all of his commandments. Then he says, my daughter, do not let kindness and truth leave you. He says, my daughter, bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablets of your heart. So what are you writing on the tablet of your heart? Truth and kindness is what you are to be writing if you're going to follow what the verse says. Turn with me to John 17, verse 17. John 17, verse 17. Get an amen when you're there. John 17, 17. John 17, 17. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So if God's word is truth, and you are to write truth on the tablets of your heart, this book is God's word. And what he is saying to you today, take this book and live by it. Take this book and learn from it. Take this book and love its precepts. Take this book and use it to be your guide as you raise your children. Take this book and teach your children to love it as much as you do. But if you do not love it, how can you teach them to love it? Remember last time I was here, we had a fountain, and it was connected to a cup. And the water came from the fountain into my cup, but then it went from my cup into another's cup. You guys remember that? The water flows from one cup to another. The water comes to us, and then we pass it on. It never stops flowing. So it is with the Word of God. You cannot teach your children what you have not first learned yourself. The secret to your success in raising your children to walk in the way of the Lord is you must first choose to be walking with Him yourself. Then and only then can you teach your children to do what you are doing. You see, your children watch you and they copy you. If you want God-fearing, God-loving children, you must show them what it looks like to love Him and fear Him. Now, for those mothers who have tried to raise their children to love and fear God, and I know there's plenty who have, and the children have gone a different direction, and I know there are plenty who have, I don't want you to beat yourself up. I don't want you to live with remorse. I don't want you to live in regret. You see, God the Father had two perfect children who were placed in a perfect world and given a perfect garden home. And these two perfect children in this perfect garden home still made a choice not to follow what their father had taught them. So if your children were raised by you to love and fear the Lord, and they have gone in a different direction, love them, pray for them, and continue to show them the love of the Father in the way that you live your life even now. But at the end of the day, there's nothing you can do to save your children. At the end of the day, there's nothing you can do to save yourself. At the end of the day, the only thing anyone can do is to make a choice to surrender daily their will to the Father in heaven. Salvation is a free gift from God to you, but you must accept it for yourself. Salvation is a free gift from God to your children, but they must choose to accept it 
for themselves. Do you want your children to follow in the path of Joseph, Moses, Samuel, and Jesus? Then you must make a decision today and every day to surrender your will to his. You must begin today letting him write his words on the tablets of your heart. You must choose to begin today having a relationship with your Lord and Savior. Today is a day to surrender to the one who loves you and died to save you. Are you tired? Do you struggle to have that meaningful relationship with Jesus? Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Jesus says, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Do you need rest? Are you weary and burdened? Come to Jesus. Don't delay. Come to Jesus today. Find rest in him. He is waiting with open arms. He says, come. Come just as you are. He will give you rest. He will give you the strength you need to surrender all to him. He will empower you to have that relationship that will lead to an eternity with him. He will empower you to know how to raise your children for his kingdom. He says, come with a humble spirit that is surrendered to me, and I will do the rest. He's inviting you, come. Come, just as you are. Come to Jesus today. Surrender your will to his, and he will do the rest.